Good morning students, welcome to this morning's contact session for learner support in English. I'm Ms. Isabel Besidenout and this morning's session is particularly going to focus on how you should approach your assignment which is due for January 2018. First of all I would like to look at an introduction for this specific module. It is a module that is studied in year 4 semester 1. The aims of the module is to teach you to analyze learning support of issues regarding the teaching, learning of grammar, speaking, reading, writing, prose, poetry, and it also touches upon assessment. English school subject or any school subject content is a vehicle for education because through such content the learners start to understand the world they live in, the systems we use, and some values and skills to cope with future work and life. Specifically the aims of the module are to enable you to develop the theoretical understanding, values and competencies regarding the support of upper primary learners in English. Now how should you approach this assignment? First of all, as with any assignment or task that you should do, you should read questions carefully to determine what should be included in your answer as well as how you should approach the answer. Use your study guide as your main source of reference and if you look at the questions you'll see typically question 1 will be from unit 1, question 2 will um, cover unit 2 um, and so forth. If only facts are required you must please take care to write this information in your own words without changing the meanings in meaning in other words you should paraphrase you should not merely copy directly from the text if level two and three questions are asked they require your own input in addition to stating the facts this means it may require that you come up with your own conclusion after you've considered the relevant facts thus it requires that you make a certain judgment and or that you give your own opinion on what was discussed. Now let's also take a look at the action verbs because they are the ones that will tell you which thinking processes are important. There's a table of verbs in the beginning of your study guide that you can have a look at and this guides you in how to approach your questions in assignments as well as in examinations. It's question seven, oh, sorry people, section seven to be specific in the beginning of the study guide. And I want to look at three action verbs particularly because they will be included in this assignment. The first one is to distinguish. Note that it means to describe two things according to relevant criteria and to then point out clearly the differences between the two sets. If you are asked to evaluate, you should answer um, something that explains how great or valuable or important a certain aspect is and you should also make a judgment that is backed by a discussion of the evidence or the reasoning that is involved in your answer. If you are asked to discuss, it means you need to give a clear description and then argue about features by pointing out positive as well as negative features and then arrive at a conclusion. Now let's move over to Unit 1 where we focus on the cognitive domain. Now what's interesting here, this unit um, on the cognitive domain actually helps you and tells you exactly what we mean by Level 1, 2 and 3 questions and what each of these entail. So if we talk about the cognitive domain, we're talking about knowledge and the development of intellectual skills. It includes recall or recognition of specific facts, procedural patterns and concepts that serve in the development of intellectual abilities and skills. And there are six major categories of cognitive processes starting from the simplest to the most complex. The first level is remembering or knowing. Then you are simply required to recognize or recall knowledge from memory. Remembering is when memory is used to produce or retrieve definitions, facts or lists 
or to recite previously learned information. So that's the simplest function and those are your level 1 type of questions. Also part of level 1 is to show that you understand something. That means you construct meaning from different types of functions. It can be written or graphic messages or activities like interpreting, exemplifying, classifying, summarizing, inferring, comparing or explaining. Now when we get to the level 2 type of questions, we refer to applying and to analyzing. Applying means that you carry out or use a procedure through executing or implementing something. It relates or refers to situations where learned material is used through products like models, presentations, interviews or simulations. If you are asked to analyze, it means you should break materials or concepts into parts and then see how these parts relate to one another, how they interrelate or how the parts relate to an overall structure or purpose. The mental actions that can be required here include differentiating, organizing and attributing as well as distinguishing. Then we move over to our um, higher level functioning and that is when you are asked to evaluate or to create. Evaluate implies that you make a judgment based on criteria and standards through checking and critiquing. It can include critiques, recommendations and reports that demonstrate evaluation. When you are asked to create, you should put elements together to form a coherent or functional whole. You reorganize elements into a new pattern through generating, planning or producing. It requires one to put parts together in a new way or to synthesize parts into something new and different. Thus, you create a new form or product. And this is the most difficult mental function that we get. In Unit 2, you are asked to look at the importance of teaching values in all subjects. And here you are asked to evaluate it. Now we've just gone through evaluating so consider that when you look at the facts presented in the study guide. Teaching is not just about teaching a subject but it's also about teaching values. It's especially true when we teach a language as we need to raise awareness especially about cultural differences. As teachers we need to convey values whatever our subjects simply because we are human beings and we work with and influence human beings. Our classroom is a community and we teach learners from various backgrounds with different needs and aspirations. This is what makes teaching so unique because we should be in charge of teaching and modeling values to our learners. In socially, culturally and economically deprived areas, teaching these values can be an everyday fight. Now the question comes to mind, how can one instill these values on teenagers that are responsible for their disabled parents, for instance? Or how can you explain to a bully the importance of respect? Another question that comes up when we teach values is how can you insist on children's rights when some children are abused? So there are many things that we need to consider in a deprived type of area. For example, if you teach languages, the questions of respect, empathy and tolerance are naturally embedded in the curriculum. Respect, care and empathy are universal values and they have to be taught inside and outside the classroom. All teaching in fact should be based on these values, whatever the subject. As teachers we tend to naturally promote these values when we encourage and promote communication in the classroom. When you give learners the opportunity to express themselves and give their opinions on different topics, we are actually teaching them the value of respect and as they need and sorry, as they need to listen to each other in those cases. What are other ways that values can be taught to the learners in the classroom? You can help them to develop a love for learning by doing so. You can pursue excellence in high standards. Help them to develop care and respect for themselves and others and also to take pride in their work. 
It also helps in exhibiting a strong sense of fairness and social justice and helps him to respect and understand Namibia's history, including the cultures and experiences of the different ethnic groups. And it also finally helps them to become active participants as citizens of the society. In Unit 3, you will be asked to develop your own lesson plan. And there's a template that you will be given to use. And my advice to you here is to have a look at Unit 7 as well as Unit 8, where there are examples of how to write lesson plans. This specific lesson that you choose might be on any topic, but it should be something suitable for Grade 7. You should not only look at the study guide, but you should also consider the English second language syllabus, Grade 5 to 7, when you work out this lesson plan. Unit 4 is the subject or covers the topic of listening, specifically different kinds of listening activities. Now the teacher should here focus on the certain ways that you can help students to focus their attention during listening. One way is to give a simple listening task, for example a table of information for students to complete as they listen. What you can also do is give one or two guiding questions before the listening and let the students listen and find the answers. To further assist them in listening, you can introduce the topic beforehand so that the students are able to predict what they might hear. You can also divide the listening into two stages. One, there can be a stage where students or learners should listen for main ideas and then the second where the student listens again but this time for details. If you have a particularly long text it's better to divide it into sections and then to check comprehension after each section. If you use a cassette recorder for intensive listening you can do it as follows. Play the whole text and then check for general comprehension. Play a part of the text again, pausing after particular re remarks to see if the students could catch or understand what was said. And then if it is necessary, you could rewind the cassette a little way and play the remark again. Very importantly, also consider the type of questions that you may ask in a listening lesson that they are suitable for the content that you include and also for the student or the learner that you are working with. There are different kinds of listening that you can test. For instance, if you ask learners to listen for a main idea, the purpose is to train them to grasp main points or general information presented in the audio or the classroom presentation. If learners have to listen for details, the purpose is to train them to grasp specific information, details that are relevant, important or necessary, or the goal is to help them obtain the detailed information that they may need. A third type is listening for a sequence. Here the purpose is to act on orders that they need to follow, and it's vital that they get the right order, that they understand the sequence correctly, and also what each step entails. When they listen for specific vocabulary, the purpose is to identify and remember a series of words which are usually easily categorized. And the last type of listening is listening for attitude and opinions. Now this will imply that they have to discern different attitudes and positions and also identify how the speaker feels. We move over to Unit 5 and the question that I asked here covers the gender differences between learners' reading motivation and reading choices. There is quite a lot of information to consider when you answer this question, but remember you should choose a book and then base your answer on your choice of book and also the following for information that's covered in the guide. Now, when we look at girls' motivation to read, we see that it differs significantly from that of boys. They mostly like to read female-oriented type of books, but they will also read gender-neutral books, but never male-oriented books. 
In contrast, if we look at boys' reading motivation, it's associated with a desire to read male-oriented books, of course. Boys are more likely to want to read science fiction, fantasy sports and comedy themes, while girls prefer to read about romance, adventure and animal-related themes. The findings are consistent with previous studies that have reported that girls typically have more reading motivation than boys. Furthermore, they found that learners' reading preferences may not only be influenced by their sex, but also to the extent that they identify with feminine and masculine characteristics. Girls' and boys' reading preferences can be influenced by what is deemed appropriate according to gender norms as well. And learners' frequent exposure to books and literacy help them to develop their reading comprehension and reading skills. That being said, if a learner's engagement with reading um, is difficult, in other words, if the person struggles to read, it will also be a challenge and serve as less motivation to actually read. If a learner um, is struggling, as I said, it will not be an enjoyable activity to read, thus it will create a constellation of characteristics, including lack of motivation, lack of reading skills, and a lack of reading automaticity. In the book, in read, if reading don't, oh, sorry, the book's name is Reading, Don't Fix No Chevys by Smith and Wilhelm. They identified the following findings about boys and girls and reading. First of all, girls comprehend fiction better than boys. Boys seem to prefer non-fiction, magazines and newspapers, and they tend to prefer short texts or texts with short sections. Girls enjoy leisure reading more than boys do. Many boys enjoy reading about sports and hobbies. And graphic novels and comic books are more popular with boys than girls. They, um, boys prefer visual texts and they really do judge a book by its cover. Furthermore, research also tells us the following. That on average, boys are less enthusiastic about reading and also less likely to choose to read. Thus, they spend less time reading. 45% of girls reported that they read for enjoyment for more than 30 minutes each day, while only 30% of boys reported the same. Boys are less likely to discuss what they are reading, and they have different reading preferences, as we said. They generally will enjoy narrative reading, although a bit less than girls, and generally they prefer fast-paced adventures, mystery, horror as well as humor. They often enjoy reading a series and serials and they like to identify with a character, a set of characters or a continuing story over many books. We also see that they will enjoy books which match their image of themselves, of who they are or who they want to be. So this might include stories based around hobbies as well as interests. They like to see an immediately functional application to what they are reading, and they tend to have a stronger preference for non-fiction than girls. When they provided with a list of genres from which to select, 28% of boys chose non-fiction as one of their top three genres, but only 30% of girls did. Now this can be explained by the boys' desire for immediate functionality. Boys also enjoy vision, visual and multimodal reading opportunities, as we said, such as comic book, graphic novels, IT, as well as web-based reading. Research shows that visually supported literacy is essential to boys', in, boys engagement and growth in literacy. It continues to say that the content of what they are reading can impact on boys' comprehension. Recent research showed that their levels of interest in a particular topic appears to directly influence their level of understanding. For example, pre-existing interest and motivation will boost a boy's engagement with and subsequent understanding of a text. Boys like to be able to see a purpose in what they do 
and make links to other learning both in and beyond school. If there's a lack of motivation and negative attitudes towards reading, these are the two factors that are most commonly encountered by teachers in boys specifically. A negative circle can develop where boys who cannot or do not read fall further behind and become even less motivated. Researchers in the area of motivation have argued that motivation is the prerequisite to reading and to learning. This brings us to Unit 7, which also covers reading, but this time a very, very interesting topic and also something that we should encourage our learners to do in class, and that is reading extensively. Now, what do we mean by extensive reading? It's reading for fluency, and it, re it involves reading longer texts for pleasure. It's not meant for understanding specific details. It's an activity in fluency. Here the, le the learners can read on their own and it's also called rapid reading or independent silent reading. There are very specific objectives to extensive reading. They are to understand the meaning as quickly as possible, to increase passive vocabulary, to develop a taste for reading, the habit of reading for pleasure and to concentrate upon subject matter. The term extensive reading means to read silently and quickly and the learner reads without the help of the teacher. It trains the reader to understand subject matter as quickly and efficiently as possible and it plays a vital role in the learning of a second or foreign language. The learners are made to read as much as possible and they are given a choice and freedom to select books of their choice. For this type of reading, the reading should have its own reward. There are few or no follow-up activities. The reading texts are within the linguistic competence of the reader and the learners are permitted to read at their own pace. They choose when to read as well as where to read. What the aim is, finally, or the, the real overall aim of this type of reading is that it creates interest among the learners so that they learn to read faster without any disturbance. Our final unit in this module covers assessment. And I would like to focus first of all on what the different types of assessment are. The first, called formative assessment, refers to any means by which learners receive input and guiding feedback on their relative performance to help them improve or absent their grades. It can be provided by face-to-face -face, um, encounters in office hours, also in written comments on their papers, projects and problem sets, and also through emails. And this type of assessment can be used to measure the learner's learning on a daily, ongoing basis. Then we come to summative assessment. This refers to when you have tests, quizzes, and other graded course activities that are used to measure a learner's performance. It usually is cumulative, and it often reveals what learners have learned at the end of a course. The next type of assessment, assessment is referred to as diagnostic assessment and it's an essential device in a teacher's toolkit as it can be used to diagnose strengths and areas of need in learners. It involves the gathering and the careful evaluation of detailed data using a learner's knowledge and skills in a given learning area. Then we finally come to continuous assessment, which I believe we are all familiar with. They advise that you should plan and schedule your continuous assessment at the beginning of the year and keep it as simple as possible. Marks should be given for class activities, assignments, homework or short tests on completion of a topic and can be recorded for continuous assessment. Then we also get something called integrative assessment. 
This is designed to help learners to discover and understand connections between knowledge, skills and to graduate attributes that they learn throughout the different lessons. And then our informal techniques that we know about are also called authentic or alternative and the purpose of these are basically to allow teachers to track the ongoing progress of their learners regularly and often. Please take note as we talk about these types of assessment, some of the descriptions might overlap so something might be an informal technique, but it might also be a continuous technique. So please be aware that they are not um, in different compartments. There might be a certain sense of overlap overlapping for each of these. We end off um, this specific part of the module by saying that while standardized tests measure learners at a particular point in the year, ongoing assessments provide continual snapshots of where learners are throughout the school year. Now talking about assessment, what is the role and why is assessment so important in terms of education? First of all, we see that it helps teachers to gain insight into what learners understand. And this then helps them to plan and to guide instruction as well as to provide helpful feedback to learners. It also helps learners develop an awareness of how they learn and to use this awareness to adjust and advance their learning. This then enables them to take an increased responsibility for their own learning. Assessment also informs learners teachers as well as parents, as well as the broader educational community of the achievement at a certain point in time in order to celebrate success. It also helps one to plan interventions, uh, this is now referring to the teacher, and support continues, continued progress. Lastly, when we think of assessment, keep in mind that all assessment must be planned with a certain purpose in mind. Assessment for, as and of learning all have a role to play in supporting and improving learner learning and it must be appropriately balanced. The most important part of assessment is the in interpretation and the use of the information that is gleaned for its intended purpose. It's embedded in the learning process and very tightly interconnected with curriculum and instruction. Teachers as well as learners work towards the achievement of the curriculum outcomes and their assessment plays a constant role in informing instruction, guiding the learners next steps and checking progress and achievement. There are many different processes and strategies for classroom assessment and the teacher should adapt them to suit the assessment purpose as well as the needs of the individual learners. This brings us to the end of our contact session and I would once again just like to share my contact details with you. I'm Ms. Isabel Besaidenhout and you are welcome to contact me at 081251-2987 I prefer that you send me an SMS with your code of the specific subject that you need help with and then I will phone you back. You are also very welcome to send me an email if you need any help or assistance with your assignment. I am always happy and willing to help you. Thank you very much students and I wish you all the best of luck with your studies. Goodbye.